song with you. Do a song, do a, do a song with you. Yeah, do a song. First song only. Okay. Let's all stand. Oh, land of rest for thee, I sigh. When will the moment come when I shall lay my armor by and dwell in peace at home? We'll work till Jesus comes. We'll work till Jesus comes. We'll work till Jesus comes and we'll be gathered home. Oh, Jesus Christ, I fled for rest. He bade me cease to roam and leave for succor on his breast till he conducts me home. We'll work till Jesus comes. We'll work till Jesus comes. We'll work till Jesus comes and we'll be gathered home. I saw that once my Savior sighed, no more by step shall roam. With him I'll brave the shilling tide and reach my home. We'll work till Jesus comes. We'll work till Jesus comes. We'll work till Jesus comes and we'll be gathered home. Please be seated. Good morning. Good, morning, good morning. Welcome to the Lord's Church. It's good to be here today. There's a time for everything, and there's a time for us to work, a time to play, a time to rest, and a time to worship. And that is what we're going to do now. We are getting ready to worship God, and it's a great place to be, especially if you are in the Lord's Church, part of the family of God, and you have joy in your heart. And I hope if you're a Christian, you have joy in your heart. And I hope if you're a Christian, you never let anybody steal that joy. Satan's going to be after you sometimes trying to steal that joy, trying to rip it away and uh, try to make you forget all the blessings that we have in Christ. And we are here today to remember those blessings and to thank God, to praise him, to glorify him, and just to share in our Lord together as a family born again of his spirit. Praise God. If you're visiting with us today, we are so thankful you're here. We hope it's a blessing to you, and we are blessed to have you. We just ask that if you uh, get a chance, when you get a chance, fill out one of these little white cards and just drop this in the offering plate when it comes around. Um, that's just so that we can learn a little bit about, about you uh, and uh, pray for you and just contact you and just uh, find out how your experience with us here was. Uh, are we ready? Is there joy in your heart? All right, let's worship. And there are 508. A wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord, a wonderful Savior to me. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock where rivers of pleasure I see. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand. A wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord. He taketh my burden away. He holdeth my cup and I shall not be moved. He giveth me strength as my day. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand. 
with numberless blessings, each moment he crowns and filled with his fullness divine. I sing in my rapture, oh glory to God for such a redeemer as mine. He hides my soul in the cleft of the rock that shatters a dry, thirsty land. He hides my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand. When clothed in his brightness transported, I rise to meet him in clouds of the sky. His perfect salvation, his wonderful love, I'll shout with the millions on high. He hides my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hides my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand. Song before our scripture reading and our prayer will be hymn number 731. Take time to be holy, speak off with thy Lord. Abide in him always and feed on his word. Make friends of God's children, help those who are weak. Forgetting in nothing his blessings to seek. Take time to be holy, the world rushes on. Spend much time in secret with Jesus alone. Abiding in Jesus, like him thou shalt be. Thy friends in thy conduct, his likeness shall see. Take time to be holy, be calm in thy soul. Each thought and each motive beneath his control. Thus led by the Spirit to fountains of love, thou soon shall be fitted for service above. Good morning. morning. Reading from Philippians 3, 18 through 21. For I have often told you and now say again with tears that many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their stomach, their glory is in their shame. They are focused on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We will transform the body of our humble conditions into the likeness of his glorious body by the power that enables him to subject subject everything to himself. Father, let us go to God in prayer. Uh, Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning and we thank you with all of our hearts for all of our many blessings. We thank you for everything that you do for us. Dear Lord, we come to you this morning and we... um, we thank you most of all that your, that your son came down to earth, he lived as a man and he died on a cross, and that he chose that your will be done. We thank you that we no longer have to live under, the, uh, under an Old Testament law that, 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 that bound us, 
that was that was something that that was something that we could never live up to. We thank you that your son uh, delivered us from this. We pray that we um, uh, we pray that we keep you in our thoughts and in our walk with with Christ each each uh, day of our lives. And once again, dear Lord, we thank you for all of our many blessings, and we pray that you um, that you forgive us as we forgive those who have sinned against us. This I pray in Jesus' name, Amen. These will be the next two songs before we have the communion as we prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper. Faithful love flowing down from the thorn-covered crown Makes me whole, saves my soul Washes whiter than snow Faithful love calms each fear Reaches down, dried each tear, holds my hand when I can stand on my own. Faithful love from above came to earth to show the Father's love. And I is his name faithful love is a friend just when hope seems to end welcome face sweet embrace tender touch filled with grace faithful love endless power living flame spirit's fire burning bright in the night guiding my way faithful love from above came to earth to show the father's love and I'll never same for I've seen faithful love face to face and Jesus is his name let us all stand please in Christ alone my hope is found he is my light my strength my song this cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand, in Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, still on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied, for every sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ I live, there in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain. Then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. And as
as he stands in victory. Since curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his and he is mine. But with the precious blood of Christ, no guilt in life, no daring death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I'll stand. Here in the power of Christ I'll stand. Please be seated. Uh, at this time, we need to remember Christ, that the love that he has for us, and how he watches over us and takes care of us, and he'll be with us always to the end, um, as long as we are faithful to him. And we need to think back on the, to him on the cross, all the pain and suffering he went through on our behalf. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful, Lord, to be able to come and have this communion, Father, to take of this bread that represents our Lord and Savior, Father. Father, we thank you so much for the love that you have for us, that you would send your Son to die for our sins, to take on the sins of the world so that we may be sin-free in your sight and become your children, Father, and that we are able to call you Father, and that we have an inheritance in your kingdom, and that we can live by grace, Father and that we can live by faith in you and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We just ask that you continue to be with us and strengthen us each and every day. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
again as we come before you. Grateful, Father, for this Sunday school and to remember your son. To remember your gift to this world, Father. At this time, as we share in this food of the body, we, we thank you, Father, for the remembrance of the blood that your son shed for us. And do this, Father, to thank you. And we do this in his name, our Lord and Savior, Christ Jesus. Amen.
Let us all stand, please. I like to say, Lord, from the start, thank you for breaking through my heart. Thank you for tearing every chain apart. When I was lost, you made a way. You turned the darkness night into day. You are my joy and Lord, I like to say that nobody fills my heart like Jesus. Nobody fills me like you do. Oh, nobody fills my heart like Jesus. Nobody, Lord, but you. Nobody fills my heart like Jesus. Nobody fills me like you do. Oh, nobody fills my heart like Jesus. Nobody, Lord, but you. Nobody but you. When I am weak, my Lord, you're strong. Loving me even when I'm wrong. Lord, you are my salvation and my song. Every day I'll make the choice, just listening, following your voice. Being with you, I can't help but rejoice. That nobody fills my heart like Jesus. Nobody fills me like you do. Oh, nobody fills my heart like Jesus. Nobody, Lord, but you are nobody. Nobody fills my heart like Jesus. Nobody fills me like you do. Oh, nobody fills my heart like Jesus. Nobody, Lord, but you. Nobody but you. The title of today's message is, give me some of that Old Testament scripture. And you might be thinking to yourself, I thought we were in Galatians. Well, we are. We're actually in Galatians chapter 4. And if you have your Bibles, please turn to Galatians chapter 4. We're going to be looking at verses 21 through 31. And you know what I think? And you might be thinking, it doesn't really matter a whole lot what you think. No matter what God thinks. Well, I think you'll agree with me on this when I, I say, and I believe that God will agree on this, that it's time to get serious about decision-making. Good decision-making has lost its place of prominence in our culture. People now live in the moment. Isn't that what Twitter is all about? Texting is all about, and all this tweeting that's going on all the time? Because people are so caught up living in the moment. They think everybody wants to know exactly what they're doing at that moment. Or they care enough to tell everybody else in the world what they're doing at that moment. That's what it's all about. What are you doing right now? How does it feel right now? What's going on in your world right now? Well, it's time to place a high priority on decision making and young people, teens, young adults. I want to talk to you just for a minute here, specifically. Because you need to learn, you need to understand, you need to get really a grip and a grasp on the impact that a decision made in a moment can have on you and can have on the rest of your life. And sometimes people make major decisions without enough thought or discussion. And there is no greater decision that a person can make than the one they make about Jesus Christ. And I love to start a sermon with really good news. And we have some really good news because we have a new sister in Christ today. Jennifer Calloway was baptized on Thursday. Jennifer, if you could just raise your hand for a second so everybody can see who you are. Praise God for that. And at the end, uh, after the invitation, before we go over and have our fellowship meal, we're going to get her and her kids up here and we're going to gather around her like we do and have a prayer over her and just thank God for this new sister we have in Christ. And this issue, this, this contemplation over this decision that a person has to make about Jesus Christ and agreeing that he is Lord and Savior and making Jesus Lord of their life, not just Savior, is so critical. That's exactly what Paul was writing about to the church in Galatia here. And why Paul wrote so much about the law versus the grace of God available only in Christ. Now, let's talk about bad decision-making. We've all made some bad decisions in our lives, and 
if we're blessed by God, they won't be uh, lifelong uh, consequences. But let's look at bad decision making and talk about characteristics of bad decision making. And I want to lay out three things for you here in terms of uh, bad decision making. Unfortunately, many bad decisions have devastating effects. Devastating. I mean, you can be going one way, great, enjoying your life, everything is wonderful, God is blessing you, and you make a bad decision and it turns on a dime, and you could be miserable for a long time. Unfortunately, many bad decisions also have, listen to this, lifelong and eternal consequences. Many bad decisions can have lifelong and eternal consequences. Number three, unfortunately, many bad decisions affect, here's the really sad part, affect many more people than just the person that's making the decision. Right? We've all experienced that. But the thing about bad decisions is we need to understand what drives them. And usually, bad decisions are emotionally charged and driven by the desires of the flesh. That's what Paul was dealing with here and talking to the church in Galatia, and now the Apostle Paul will deliver what he considers to be a knockout punch to deal with the Jews who are still clinging to the law. And he will clinch his lengthy discussion concerning the bondage of the law versus freedom in Christ. And he will do so using an illustration from the Old Testament, an illustration involving the sons of Abraham, and an illustration that will counter the false teachings of the Jews claiming to be Christians. Now remember that, that's what we're talking about. These Jews clinging to the law who are claiming to be Christians, but Paul, as you recall, actually referred to them as imposters. They are not true Christians. Paul will compare and contrast what he calls and what we know as the two covenants, one of which the false teachers must choose. He lays it out like this in this passage. Ishmael, who was born of Hagar, who was the slave or bondservant of Abraham's wife, Sarah. Now we're going to get more into that, but I hope you recall the story, and as we're talking through this, more details will unfold in your mind. But Isaac, who was born of Sarah who was the rightful wife of Abraham and a free woman. Let's look at Galatians chapter 4 and look at verses 21 through 31. And here it says, and Paul writes to them, straightening this whole issue out. Tell me, those of you who want to be under the law, don't you hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave and the other by a free woman. But the one by the slave was born according to the, look at this, the impulse of the flesh, while the one by the free woman was born as the result of a promise. Verse 24, these things are illustrations, and it's been said a picture is worth a thousand words, and Paul is trying to give them an illustration to help them understand what they're doing. And he is solving the problem and laying things out. These things are illustrations for the women represent the two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai and bears children into slavery. This is Hagar. Now Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. Not only is she in slavery, but her children are in slavery. 26, but the Jerusalem above is free, and she is our mother. For it is written, Rejoice, childless woman who does not give birth. Burst into song and shout. You who are not in labor, for the children of the desolate are many, more numerous than those of the woman who has a husband. Now you brothers, like Isaac, are children of the promise. But just as then the child born according to the flesh persecuted the one born according to the spirit, so also now, verse 30, but what does the scripture say? Drive out the slave and her son, for the son of the slave will never, look at this, the son of a slave will never be a co-heir with the son of the free woman. Therefore, brothers, we are not children of the slave, but of the free woman. And here, Paul is counteracting the Jews who are clinging to the law of Scripture by using Scripture. 
Listen, Paul knows the scriptures. There's no doubt about that. And he's laying it on him here. He's laying it on them here by asking them a question. In Galatians 4.21, he says, tell me, or ask them, tell me, those of you who want to be under the law, don't you hear the law? You're putting yourself under it, but you're not even listening to it. Why would you do that? That does not even make any sense. And he asks this because the law clearly points to Jesus Christ as being the Messiah. And Paul also asks this because he knows, he knows they're making a big mistake. The same kind of mistake that Abraham and Sarah made. Now let's talk about some of the factors, some of the points that Paul is making here in this portion of the letter. Number one, the promise of God always, always, always trumps the work of the flesh. The promise of God always trumps the work of the flesh. If you're a card player, you know very well what the word trump means, right? It's above everything else. No matter what you think you have, no matter how good you think it is, whatever I'm going to do now, whatever I'm going to lay down, trumps whatever you've done. It's, it's the ultimate. It's the best. It's the most powerful. It takes everything. And the promise of God trumps the work of the flesh. In Galatians 4, 22 and 23, Paul writes, For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave and the other by a free woman. But the one by the slave was born according to the impulse of the flesh, while the one by the free woman was born as a result of a promise, a promise that was made by God. And one thing we know for sure is that a promise that is made by God is going to be kept 100%, 100% of the time. The way he said it, it will happen. The way he says he will do it, he will do it. The timing he says it's going to happen in, it's going to happen in. You can count on that 100%. When God makes a promise, it's going to occur that way. Praise God, right? That's where our joy comes from. Because we are relying on the promise of God rather than ourselves. That's what Paul's getting at here. That's the whole point. And God promised Abraham that he would have a son from his own body. That comes from Genesis 15, 4. And Abraham was concerned because at this time he had no children and he was concerned that his estate would go to an heir that was a slave, a slave by the name of Eliezer. And Eliezer, by the way, and I find this very interesting, was from Damascus. And that was the place Paul was headed to when he had his encounter with Jesus Christ. He was on the road to Damascus to round up more Christians, to bring them back to Jerusalem to have them stand trial. But you know what happened here? In this particular case that Paul's talking about, Abraham and Sarah lacked faith in the promise of God. And they lacked faith in God's ability to work through them. Don't we do that sometimes? Don't we lack faith that God can actually work through us according to his promise like he said he would? Sometimes we do that. We need to have more faith in the promise of God. We need to have more faith in the word of God. We need to have greater understanding in the word of God so that we can have faith in the promises of God. You can't know the promise if you don't know the word. And Paul is saying here, I know you know the scriptures. Let's go back to what you know. Let me set things right in accordance with what you already know. Somehow or another, Sarah and Abraham thought that God needed their help in keeping his promise. Right? We've done that before. But what, we, what do we know to be true? Listen, listen, listen. Hey, God does not need our help in keeping his promise. He doesn't need it. What he wants is our trust in his promise. What he wants is our obedience to his promise. He doesn't need our help. We, might, we may think he does sometimes. When we don't see it happening, what? The way we want or in the time frame we want, then we think we've got to step in and do something. Well, that's kind of what they were thinking. We've got to make this happen because in our understanding, there's only a certain amount of time left, dear. <laughs> 
you got to have faith. you got to have faith that God will be true to his promise, as he said. And you know what they did? Because they thought that God needed their help, they decided on an impulse of the flesh to take matters into their own hands. Now, legally speaking, by the law, nothing wrong with what they did, but they thought they needed to help God out. So they decided, in Genesis 16, Sarah suggests that Hagar become Ab Abram's wife and that through her they would have a child. And I say Hagar here because uh, her name wasn't changed yet. Hagar bears Abram, and his name wasn't even changed yet, a son, and they named him Ishmael. But then in Genesis 17, in spite of what they have done in the flesh, now look at this, here is the mercy of God, and here is God shining through. Because even when we fail, even when we try to do it our way, even when we think we need to help God out, that does not alter the fact that God will be true to his promise. He will always come through. Because God cannot tell a lie. And God will not go back on his promise. And God makes good on his promise. In Genesis 17, verses 15 through 19, let's look at that. God said to Abraham, as for your wife, Sarai, do not call her Sarai, for Sarah will be her name. I will bless her, indeed. I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she will produce nations. Kings of peoples will come from her. Abraham fell face down. Then he laughed and said to himself, can a child be born to a hundred-year-old man? Can Sarah, a 90-year-old woman, give birth? So Abraham said to God, if only Ishmael were acceptable to you. But God said, no. Your wife Sarah will bear you a son, and you will name him Isaac. I will confirm my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his future offspring. God's saying, hey, no, I'm going to do it like I said. Thanks for your help, but I don't really need it. I'm going to do it my way. Here's what's going to happen. Now, here's the really good part. This came right after God establishes the covenant of circumcision. And this whole issue that we're dealing with, that, that we're struggling with, and that we're talking about here in the church in Galatia was where, you know, these Jewish Christians who are claiming to be Christians, I should say, were trying to force circumcision on these Gentile converts, telling them they have to submit themselves to the law as well as to Christ in order to be saved. Paul saying, now get this, here's the really good part. What we're talking about in this passage right now in Genesis here came right after God established the covenant of circumcision. In Genesis 17, 9 and 10, here's what it says. God also said to Abraham, As for you, you and your offspring after you throughout their generations are to keep my covenant. This is my covenant, which you are to keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every one of your males must be circumcised. And what Paul is saying here, you've got to make a choice. You've got to make a choice. You've got to understand what you're doing. And it's better to rely on the promise of God than on the works of the flesh. Put your hope in God. Don't put your hope in yourself. Don't put your hope in the law. And don't put your hope in your ability to live by the law. Because you can't. You can't. And because the promise of God will trump the work of the flesh. Paul summarizes this here in Galatians. Let's look at Galatians 4.27. And he writes, For it is written, Rejoice, childless woman, who does not give birth. Burst into song and shout, you who are not in labor. For the children of the desolate are many, more numerous than those of the woman who has a husband. What Paul's doing here is he's pointing them the Old Testament scriptures of Isaiah, because this verse here is, is a complete restatement of Isaiah 54, verse 1. And he's helping them to understand that, look, you can't have it both ways. You want to be under the law? You're under the law. And I tell you, if you are under the law, you will die by the law, because you cannot live up to God's standard on your own adhering to the law. Never going to happen. You've got to make a choice whether you're going to be under grace or under the law. You're going to accept the blood of Christ or you're going to rely on yourself. And that's what every person in this world, since the time Jesus came into the world, has to decide. On that day, 
on that day, I'm talking about judgment day, on that day, are we deciding to stand before God in and on our own ability to be righteous before God? Or are we saying, hey, I know I can't do that. I know I want to be covered by the blood of Christ. I want to have my sins washed away by the blood of Christ. And I need to be saved by the grace of God in Christ, through Christ, because of Christ, because I know there's no way I can do it on my own. That's the choice. What he's saying here is that this scripture indicates that the later born children of the promise will far outnumber their earlier offspring. And this scripture also talks about the future glory of Israel, which leads us to point number two. So we'll reemphasize this. Everyone must choose to be associated with an earthly kingdom or a heavenly kingdom. That's the choice. You can be part of this earthly kingdom or you can be part of the heavenly kingdom. Now, we know what Scripture says about who the earthly kingdom belongs to. Satan, he's the ruler of the power of the air. This is his kingdom. This isn't the kingdom of God, right? We are the kingdom of God in Christ here on earth. And every person has to choose to be associated with an earthly kingdom or a heavenly kingdom. Look at Galatians 4.24 through 4.26. These things are illustrations for the women represent the two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai and bears children into slavery. This is Hagar. Now Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present Jerusalem. The present Jerusalem. For she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free and she is our mother. What he's saying here is that citizenship in heaven comes by the free gift of God's grace in Christ. And those who are born again are children of the heavenly kingdom and are citizens in heaven. And there are three things that we need to understand about our citizenship in heaven, three important characteristics, three things we learn, three things we know from Scripture about ourselves as citizens of heaven. Number one, those who are citizens of heaven are free from the Mosaic law. We're not under the law anymore. It's done. We can't do it. Hey, if we could do it, Jesus wouldn't have come in the first place because we would have been able to save ourselves. None of us can save ourselves. The Jews before couldn't. The Gentiles couldn't. We could. Nobody can save themselves. That's why Jesus had to come to do what he did for us. Number two, those who are citizens of heaven are free from the bondage of, are free from bondage, sin, and death. And that's what Paul is addressing here. They're free from the bondage of the law. They're free from the bondage of sin. They're free from the bondage of death when they are in Christ. And turning back, turning away, going back to the law, you're putting yourself under the law, and we know what that leads to, a curse. We've been studying that. We studied that a couple weeks ago. Those who live under the law are cursed. You are going to die. Not only physical death, but spiritual death. And you will not be just, not guilty. God will condemn you of every sin you've ever committed in your entire life. And that leads to going to one place and one place only. But those of us who are citizens of heaven are free from trying to please God by the futile works of the flesh. We need to understand that. The works of the flesh are futile. That's what Paul is trying to get them to understand. Hey, why would you want to do that? Why would you want to rely on yourself? Well, we know why these people wanted to do it, because they were all about themselves. We talked about that last time. And why they were zealous. They weren't zealous for the good of the people that they were talking to. They were zealous for their own selves. They were zealous to be recognized as being religious, as being pious, as being outstanding, as being great men of God, and having an edge over other people. Sometimes, those are the exact same reasons why certain Christians or some Christians become legalistic. They're looking for that same kind of feeling, a feeling of being, you know, a little bit better than another Christian. Hey, look, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. We need to get that straight. We need to rem remember that. There's only one 
who is over all, Jesus Christ. The rest of us are poor, pathetic sinners in need of a Savior. And he came for us. He came for us. Number three, true Christians are children of the promise and are part of the heavenly kingdom of God. Don't let, we were talking about this in Bible class, and how important it is. And I was talking about at the beginning, Satan is going to try to steal your joy, but I can tell you this, there are going to be other people in your life who are going to try to steal your joy as a Christian because even they cannot live up to the standard that they set for themselves. And they're miserable. And you know what that misery wants? Company. And if they're miserable because they can't achieve the standard they're trying to live to, they want you to feel bad because you can't live to the standard that they've set for themselves or set for you. And that's exactly, exactly, exactly what is going on here in Galatia. And Paul's saying, don't do it. Do not let that happen. And reflect back to a verse previous to this. And he asked them, what happened to the joy? What happened to the joy you had? Where did it go? When you first heard the good news, you believed it. You accepted it with joy. You were passionate. You loved what you were doing. You loved what you were about. You received it. You were forgiven of your sins. You were right with God. You were heading in the right direction. And then something, something happened to steal you, to steal you away, to rob you of that joy. Paul's saying, uh-uh. Don't let that happen. Do not let that happen. He writes in Galatians 4, 28 through 31, Now you brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. But just as then the child born according to the flesh persecuted the one born according to the spirit, so also now. But what does the scripture say? Drive out the slave and her son. For the son of the slave will never be a co-heir with the son of the free woman. Therefore, brothers, we are not children of the slave, but of the free woman. See, Hagar and Ishmael were driven out, cast out. And she cried out to God, because what happened to her was not her fault. And here she was, desolate, out in the desert, <laughs> with her son, Ishmael. She cried out to God, and God heard her cry. And out of the grace of God, God decides and promises Abraham. And Abraham was sorry, because he was he was driven to this by his wife, who had some dissension, who had some envy, so had some, she had some bad feelings towards Hagar because of the situation. And God says, hey, I'm going to bless your child too. He tells Abraham, I'm going to bless Ishmael as well. But he will never be a co-heir with the son of the free woman. And as Christians, as citizens of the heavenly kingdom, we are co-heirs with Christ. We are co-heirs with Christ. Forget what happened on Mount Sinai. It's important, you know, but don't be relying on that for your salvation, for your standing, for your justice before me, for your righteousness to be cleansed of your sins. Count on the promise of God, the promise that God made to send forth a Savior at his appointed time. We've been studying that. Jesus came at just the right time. Hey, look. Sometimes we struggle with God's timing, but God's timing is always perfect, always accurate, always right on the dot, 100%. Right? We know that. And Ishmael was cast out. Paul's saying, you got a choice here. You want to be part of the inheritance? You want to be part of everything you can have from God in Christ, or do you want to be cast out, not part of that kingdom? Everybody has to make that choice. If you're here today, you have an opportunity to make that choice to get right with God, to be forgiven of your sins, to be born again of God's Holy Spirit, to live the kind of life that God wants you to live, holy, sanctified for him, not for yourself, but for the glory of God. If there's any other need you have, please come forward as we stand and pray. Hark the gentle voice of Jesus falleth tenderly upon your ear. Sweet his cry in love and pity calleth, ten and listen, stay and hear. 
Sing ye the labor and our heavy laden lean upon your dear Lord's breast. Ye that labor and are heavy laden, come and I will give you rest. Take his yoke, for he is meek and lowly, bear his burden to him turn. He who calleth is the master holy, he will teach if you will learn. Ye that labor and are heavy laden, lean upon your dear Lord's breast. Ye that labor and are heavy laden, come and I will give you rest. Then his loving tender voice obeying, bear his yoke, his burden take. Find the yoke is on this on you laying, light and easy for his sake. Ye that labor and are heavy laden, lean upon your dear Lord's breast. Ye that labor and are heavy laden, come and I will give you rest. Please be seated. If you've been following the bulletin, you know that the Jengus family has been on our prayer list for some time. There's a lot going on in their family, a lot of family issues, family struggles, and it's a very difficult time for them. And Bill just feels like he's getting very weak and is getting worn out, starting to feel worn down and exhausted. Man, we can all relate to that, can't we? By the stress, by the battle that's being waged in his family and over his family. And man, we talk about this so often. And, and one of the things I love to talk about, teach about, preach about is spiritual warfare and how real it really is. And there is a war being waged against our souls every day. And we know who's bringing it. But we, knows, we know who's, who we belong to, right? That's right? We know who's truly in control, and you're a child of God. Amen. We praise God for that. And he just wants the prayers of the church for fighting this battle and for just clinging to the victory, remembering that we have the victory already in Christ, and just relying on the strength of Christ to get us through all things. Thank mm. you. And uh, we're going to pray for you. We're going to ask Jennifer to come up with her two kids, Kobe and Kaylin. Bring our elders up here. No, just go ahead. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity we have that we can gather together here as fellow members of, of this, this glorious church that you established. Thank you so much for the promises that you give us. We thank you so much for the, the liberty that we can have in Christ Jesus. We thank you so much for that spirit that you place in our bodies and tell us to lean on them. Thank you so much for Bill, who has come forward this morning. We pray for his family. We pray for the struggles that families go through, the, the, the things that have been happening in, in, in Bill's family. We bless them and, and help them to, to, take, to take the time to, to take their burdens off of their shoulders and place them on yours. That their labors can be eased if, if you'll just give them to you and, and let you take care of them. Thank you so much for their faithfulness and thank you so much for their desire to want to, to have prayers for them and to lean on you at this particular time. We thank you so much for Jennifer who's been baptized and we thank you so much that she's given her life over to you. We pray as fellow members of this congregation that we'll support her, that we'll do whatever needs to be done to help her follow on the path of, of, of life eternal. Thank you so much for her efforts and her willingness to, to follow you and place her life in your hands. 
dear God, thank you so much for blessing all of us in here and the, and the fact that we all have that, that life eternal if we just follow your path. Thank you so much for blessing all of us this morning and we pray that our worship has been glorious to you, glorious to your name, and glorious to God. Thank you so much for everything you do for us. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Congratulations, Jesse. All right? Oh, you're the nurse. Yeah, yeah. Family that's been born again, part of the family whose love knows no end, for Jesus has saved us and made us his own, never part of the family that's on its way home. And sometimes we laugh together, sometimes we cry, Sometimes we share together heartaches and sighs. Sometimes we dream together of how it will be when we all get to heaven, God's family. We do have a few announcements before we are dismissed. If you haven't already done so, I encourage you to please pick up a bulletin on your way out. A lot of stuff in here, that uh, all of which I can't go over. Um, scripture references from the sermon, um, an extensive prayer list. Be sure to keep all those in your prayers. Um, and please continue to pray for the Jenkins family as well. Um, upcoming events we have uh, today is our outreach and fellowships uh, meal after the worship. We encourage everybody who can attend to attend next door. Um, and I will be praying for the food as we dismiss. Um, March 31st, which is this coming Saturday, is the Capital Church of Christ uh, Youth Rally with the theme, Living in the Flesh, Walking in the Spirit. Um, any of the youth that are interested to attend that, um, please get in contact with, we'll say Ian, and he can divvy that up. And uh, there's information on the bulletin board about that as well. March 31st is also the Camp Manitoni Work Day from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. There's a flyer on the bulletin board for that. Um, April 1st through 4th, the Ohio Valley University is having their lectureship. There's information online and there's a website in the bulletin if you're interested in attending that. April 15th um, will be, is tax day, but it's also an area-wide sing for Salisbury Church of Christ. Any of those that can attend after worship on Sunday to that, please, we're encouraged to do so. Um, Salisbury always has a, a fantastic turnout for everything that we do, and um, we should do the same for them. Uh, May 19th uh, is the Ladies' Day at the Dover Church of Christ. So put that on your calendars. On June 22nd through 24th is the Mid-Atlantic Church of Christ Lectures in Westminster, Maryland. Um, that's a ways out, but that puts it on your calendar so you know that's coming up. And if you can attend any of those days, um, please do so. Um, the Seaford Church of Christ is awarding scholarships. If you are a graduating senior, please check the bulletin board for that. Um, along those same lines, Sean is not here today, but he asked me to make sure that he and Josh are in your prayers this week because they will be traveling to Harding. Um, Josh has an interview for a scholarship there at Harding, um, and he wanted you to pray for their travels as well as for Josh in that interview. If you've, any of you have ever talked to Josh, you'll know he'll do fine. But... Uh, Please keep him in your prayers as he goes through that. Um, and like uh, it's been mentioned a couple times, but I feel it bears mentioning again, we do have a new sister in Christ. Um, Jennifer Calloway was baptized on the 22nd. Her address is in the bulletin. If you'd like to send her a, a card or something along those lines, and please say hi to her and, and welcome her to the family when you see her. Um, I believe that's all I have. Oh, wait, I have a card up here. Let me, let me read the card first. I got you. <laughs> um, thank you for your kind expression of sympathy. At times like this, your comfort and support mean more than words can say. The flowers are beautiful. Love, Mabel. And as Mabel had a passing in her family this past week, um, we encourage you to keep her family in your prayers as well. And Ian? Just uh, offer a reminder that many groups won't be having, won't be meeting tonight because it's before Sunday. Yes. Um, actually, it's, yeah, it's, it's most of them, I believe. It's um, Most of the life groups are not meeting this week because of um, Fellowship Sunday, and that's normally the, the week that those don't meet. 
And if you haven't already done so and, and gotten involved in a life group, uh, we encourage you to do so. Um, the, all the life groups, as well as their leader information, meeting information, is all on the back of the bulletin. So again, if you are not in a life group as of right now, um, they have been a tremendous blessing to all those that have been involved in them. And uh, we encourage you to please, if you're not already in one, get in one. Anything else? Anything else? Anything else? Yes. That's April 7th. Okay, well, we'll go ahead and add that to the bulletin too. April 7th is a work day at Temperanceville Church of Christ in Virginia. It's right down 13. It's pretty, pretty simple drive. It's just about an hour. Um, but they're, they're a very, if you don't know anything about Temperanceville, they're a very small congregation. Um, but they always have people show up to anything that we have or Salisbury has or Easton has. They, they really do travel well, and anything that we can do to encourage them and help them, I know they'd greatly appreciate. Anything else? Yes. Why? <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, the spaghetti, the spaghetti dinner is taking a break. Um, this Wednesday will be the last. Um, if you haven't come early for that, um, you can go ahead and come this Wednesday, or else you can wait till the fall. It's always really good, and I enjoy the the garlic bread that they leave over. Delicious. <laughs> If that's all, let us go to God in prayers. We're dismissed. Dear Lord, we'd like to thank you so much for allowing us to come together today to, to worship you, Lord, to, 